today we are going to look at a lot of graphs and practice recognizing main effects and interactions in line graphs and bar graphs. Um, you have to do this on the problem set, you'll have to do it on the test. They talk about it a little bit in your book, but we're going to go into much more detail and practice it quite a bit. We're also going to talk about how to calculate F observed and identify F critical and how to do F squared for main effects and for interaction from APA source table. We're going to do that at the end of class today. Um, also, a little change in plans for next Tuesday at students' request. Uh, we're going to be doing the problem set in here with me and we're going to be doing the article worksheet in lab. So we had, on, on the syllabus it's reversed, we were going to do the article worksheet in here and the problem set in lab. Um, but I've had some students ask if we could do the problem set in here because they like my explanation of how we do things and they, uh, so they'd like me to do that. Uh, so please make sure that you have your problem set done, turned in before you come to class on Tuesday, your article worksheet done and turned in before you go to lab on Tuesday. And our exam for the last exam before the final is a week from today. Okay. So, yeah. And now we got then we have three papers to write before we get to the end of the semester. So th there's no rest for the wicked and not for us either. Right? <laughs> okay. So make sure you've got a handout if you haven't got one. Uh, because you don't want to, like that, yeah, exactly. Grab one of those because um, you don't want to draw all these graphs. We've got a lot of graphs to look at today. All right. So we're going to start from a place with particular experiment, and we're going to look at different possible outcomes for that experiment. Our experiment is a two by two random groups factorial design. What does that mean? If it's a two by two random groups factorial design, what does that mean? Yes? The first IV is two and the second IV is two. That's right. It means I have two IVs, right? Because I gave you two numbers. And the first one has two levels, and the second one has two levels. Okay, our first IV is beverage type, whether the beverage is an alcoholic beverage or a non-alcoholic beverage. And our second IV is expectation. Did the subjects expect to get alcohol, or do they expect to not get alcohol? Okay, so do they think they're getting an alcoholic beverage, or do they think they're getting a non-alcoholic beverage? All right, now I told you this was a two by two random groups factorial design. We know what the two by two part means. What does the random groups factorial design part mean? All the IVs are manipulated. All the IVs are manipulated and what else? Between subjects. They're all between subjects, right, good. Okay, so you should be able, if I tell you something's a two by two random groups factorial design, you should be able to crank out those kinds of pieces of information. That's the kind of stuff you would extract from something like the factorial flow chart. Okay. If I told you that I had a two by two complete repeated measures factorial, what would you know? Two by two complete repeated measures factorial. Two within subjects. Yep, all of the IVs are within subjects. And, and it's complete. So they go to the, through each condition more than once? That's right, the subjects are experiencing each condition more than one time. Good. Oh yeah. So that's the kind of flow chart stuff uh, you want to know. If I said we have a two by two mixed factorial design, what would you know? Two by two mixed factorial design. Right? One's within subjects and one's between subjects. Right, good. Okay. So you and you don't and they're, they're both manipulated. Right? We have a mixed factorial design. Okay. So we've got a two by two random groups factorial design. Um, and our dependent variable, like last time, is the mean intensity of shock. So it's how will, it, how high of a shock, how intense of a shock, the subjects are willing to give a confederate for doing something they don't like, um, depending on which of these conditions they're in. Now, because both of our variables are between subjects, and we've used random assignment to put them there, everybody in each condition is different, right? We've got four conditions, <laughs> two by two, right? Two times two, four different conditions four distinct groups of subjects. So here's the first possible outcome. Now last time we talked about how you can tell, looking at a line graph, whether or not there's a likelihood that there's a main effect for the IV in the legend, how to tell if there's a main effect for the IV on the x-axis, and how to tell if there's 
and interaction between those two variables. So let's go through this graph and apply what we talked about last time. We said if there's an effect of the variable that's noted in the legend, we look to see what? What do I look for if I'm comparing in a line graph, I'm trying to tell if there's a main effect of the variable indicated in the legend? Look at the difference between the two. The difference between the two what? Okay, if they're parallel or intersecting is whether or not we have an interaction. If there's a slope is whether or not we have an effect of the x-axis. So we're getting all the right things, we just got to apply them to the right, right idea. Yeah, it's how far apart. There we go, yes, good, excellent. How far apart they are. It's, we just needed some interpretive dance. That's all right, interpretive dance for statistics, we can do that. All right, so how far apart are the lines? And here, are they very far apart? No, they're basically right up next to each other. They're right next to each other. I mean, there's a tiny bit of difference. Mostly that's so you can see that there are two lines, because if they were laying right on top of each other, you wouldn't be able to tell. So we, they're not very far apart. It looks like we do not have a main effect of expectation. In other words, it didn't make any difference whether people were, thought they were going to get alcohol or thought they were getting a non-alcoholic beverage. It didn't affect how, how much they shocked the Confederate at all. Okay, it didn't make any difference. Now we get down here to the x-axis. Now we care about... Can't look down your favorite. You have to look at me because I'm pointing at you. Oh, now we care slope. about what? Sorry. That's the okay. <laughs> now we care about... The slope. The slope, that's right. Now if the slope is zero, right? If it's a flat, the slope of the line is flat, then we're, we think that there's probably no interaction as the slope deviates from zero, could be going positive, could be going negative. As the slope deviates from zero, we are at increased likelihood of getting a main effect. Let's take a look at these lines. Does it look like we have a slope that's deviating from zero? No, these lines are looking way flat. And that means it doesn't matter whether people got an alcoholic beverage or a non-alcoholic beverage that didn't affect how much they shocked the Confederate. Everybody did it about the same. Around 45. 45 whatever we're measuring here. The intensity of the shock. Volts. Now, how do I tell if there's an interaction? If they're parallel or intersecting. That's right. So if they're parallel or to the extent that they're not parallel. So if, if they're parallel, I know what? Do I think there's an interaction or not? If they're parallel, no. To the extent that they begin to move towards each other or actually touch or cross, I'm getting a higher and higher chance of having an interaction. If we see an actual crossover, that intersection is, you know, big alarm bell should be going off, really, really excellent chance that we're going to have an interaction. If they're moving towards each other, the extent to which they do so and actually get close enough to touch um, increases our likelihood of an interaction. So, are these lines looking like they're going to touch anywhere? No. These are very chaste, well-behaved lines. They're not going to touch each other. They're just going to lay there next to each other on the graph and do nothing. What does how far apart they are tell us? How far apart they are tells us whether or not we have an effect of the IV in the legend. You can see here that the line for expecting alcohol and the line for not expecting alcohol are basically exact. They're like almost right on top of each other. So it means that it didn't matter which one of those conditions the subjects were in, it didn't change their behavior. All right, so that's the line graph. Here's the exact same data, okay? No interaction, no main effects, just like the last graph. But here it is now presented in a bar graph. You might get line graphs, you might get bar graphs in a paper. You need to be able to interpret graphs of both types. So here we've got no main effects, no interaction. Let's see what characteristics we need to pay attention to to be able to recognize this. Let's start up here, like we did last time, with the IV in the legend. If you look at that legend, you'll see that what we're comparing are black boxes and white boxes. See that? Up in the legend, there's black boxes and white boxes. Those are my options. The black boxes are expecting alcohol. The white boxes are not expecting alcohol. So what we want to do is compare those. So what I want to do is I'm going to take a look at this graph. And I want to say, okay, let me look at those black boxes and think about what would happen if I averaged them together and got one grand average black box. Okay. 
It would be the same, like they're the same height, right? So it would be this big. What would happen if I took these white boxes and averaged them together? I'd get a box this big, right? Now if I compare those, do they look like they're really different in size? The black box and the white box? My grand average mental boxes? No, they're basically exactly the same. Black box is a little tiny bit bigger than the white box, but not very much. And on your paper, even less, like a pencil width. Maybe even a pencil lead width. Okay, they're not very different. And that's telling us there's no main effect here. If I think about what's happening on the x-axis, okay, the variable on the x-axis, I'm comparing now the bars on the left to the bars on the right. The bars for the not alcoholic group, imagine that I averaged those together and got some gray bar of non-alcoholicness. And I compare that to a merged gray bar of alcoholicness. So if I took the average of the non-alcoholic bars and I compared it to the average for the alcoholic bars, you think it would be very different? They would probably be exactly the same. So no difference, no main effect. Now when it comes to interactions in a bar graph, we look for a combination of things. Because interactions are about combinations. What we're looking for, called the two Ds, difference and direction. So if I take a look at my first pair of bars over here, I see that the black bar is a little bit different from the white bar. Okay, so the bars aren't exactly the same. The black bar is a little bit different from the white bar. And the direction is the black bar is taller than the white bar. Okay, so we can summarize that by saying the direction and difference, the black bar is a little bit taller than the white bar. Now what I want to see is, do I have that same pattern in the other comparison. So I move over here now, and I say, all right, in my other comparison, is the black bar also a little bit taller than the white bar? The answer is yes. So there's no difference between the two, and I don't have an interaction. Can you repeat what you look for for the IV on the x-axis? Sure. The IV on the x-axis, you're going to compare the average of the bars in the condition on the left to the average of the bars in the condition on the right. So what you're comparing is the non-alcoholic, people who got a non-alcoholic beverage, to the people who got an alcoholic beverage. So you're just going to group these together and treat them like they were one thing. Then you're going to group these together and treat them like they were one thing and compare. Um, so if you have, if they're the same uh, direction, then there's no interaction. And if, if there's the same direction and the same difference, has to be both. Okay, so if one of them had the white taller, but they were about the same difference. You would have a potential interaction, because if you think about what that would look like in a line graph, they'd be crossing over. So it'd be potential interaction. Well, if they were actually crossing over, you would have an interaction, yeah. If you actually have reverse direction, you'd have an interaction. Okay. Can, can, do you mind going over what you have to do for it to be an interaction? We're going to go over this, we're going to go over this for every possible outcome. But yes, I'd be happy to do it again. If there's an interaction, you would, and we'll actually see an example where there's an interaction. So if the difference were substantial, so say this black bar was up here, mm -hmm. then you'd have the same direction, but the difference was off. So possible interaction. In a line graph, that would look like this. If you have a difference in um, the direction, so Black bar was black bars higher here, white bars lower here. But then on the other side, it's white bars higher, black bars lower. Then you have a difference in the direction, and then you also have an interaction. So in order to have no interaction, you need same difference, same direction. As that varies, you increase the risk or the probability of having an interaction. But we're going to get that. You're going to see every possible combination. If you look at that packet of graphs I gave you, it just goes on for pages and pages and pages. You're going to get so good at this. All right, so let's take a look at this one now. Okay. Looking at line graphs, another possible outcome for our experiment. So does it look like I have a main effect for the variable in the legend? Here, vote for yes. Tell me why. Why do you think so? Because the bars are far apart. 
okay? The bar for expecting alcohol is far away from the bar of not expecting alcohol. People who were expecting alcohol shocked the Confederate 80 volts on average. People who were not expecting alcohol shocked the Confederate 40 volts on average. So people, you could say that people who were expecting alcohol shock, give twice as high a shock as the people who were not expecting alcohol. So it was just thinking they were going to get alcohol made them shock the person twice. They were, they were free, right? I'm getting, I'm getting drunk, and if I'm drunk, I'm not responsible for my actions. I can just shock the bejeebers out of that confederate for annoying me. But they're not actually drunk, necessarily. And it made absolutely, now if you look down here at the x-axis, we see it actually made no difference whatsoever whether they were actually drunk or not. How can you tell? How do we tell if there's a main effect of what's on the x-axis? Slope, right? Slope for these lines is zero. There is no slope here. See it? Just zero. Nothing. Flat lines. These lines are not going up or down in any way. There is no effect of whether or not people actually got alcohol. Made no difference. What mattered here is whether or not they thought they were getting alcohol. And if they thought they were, they were shocky, shocky, shocky. Much, much more aggressive. What about interaction? Do you see any evidence of an interaction here? No. Why? No. These lines are very parallel. They are not moving towards each other in any way. There is not a chance that they will ever intersect in any space or time. These lines are parallel, parallel, parallel. No interaction. Now let's take a look at what that would be in a bar graph. All right, now we're switching over. Now we know. We have a main effect of expectation no effective beverage, and no interaction. Let's see if we can see that pattern in these data. So, remember if I'm looking at what's up here in the legend, I'm comparing the markers. I see black and white up there in the legend. It means I'm comparing the black bars to the white bars. If I average the black bars and compare that to the average for the white bars, are they going to be different? The average of the black bars compared to the average of the white bars. Yeah, the average for the black bars is going to be twice as big as the average of the white bars, right? That's that twice as big shock. I actually think main effects are easier to see in bar graphs because if I think about the average of those two compared to the average for those two, that is easy for me to see. Now, if we think about the main effect for what's on the x-axis. Now, I'm comparing the average of the non-alcoholic bars to the average of the alcoholic bars. Would those be different? No. no. I would have a gray bar about here. <laughs> they would both look the same. So, no main effect of beverage. But, we did get a main effect of expectation. People who thought they were getting alcohol, in both cases, shocked twice as much as people who didn't think they were getting alcohol. And we see no interaction because, remember, we're doing difference in direction. The difference here is the black bar is twice as hard as, high as the white bar. I move over and check. Is the black bar twice as high as the white bar again? Is it the same? It's the same. So, no interaction. Bobby, you're nodding. I'm glad you agree with me. Give me confidence. All right. So, what about this one? Do we have an effect of expectation? That's what's up here in the legend. Is there an effect of expectation? You say no. Why do you say no? That's right. They're right next to each other. They're smuggling up right next to each other, okay? Do we have a main effect of beverage. That's what's on the x-axis. Do it look like we might have a main effect of beverage? John says yes. Why do you think so? Because of the slope. These are definitely not flat anymore. Looks like it really mattered whether you got a non-alcoholic drink or an alcoholic drink. People who got an alcoholic drink were shocking people at 110 volts. 
people who got non-alcoholic drinks shocked people at 20 volts. They just kind of tickled up a little bit. Other people were like, <laughs> and these folks over here, these drunk folks, didn't matter whether they were expecting alcohol or not. All that mattered was whether or not they got alcohol. If they got alcohol, they were more, much more aggressive. If they didn't get alcohol, they were not. Now, what about interaction? Oh, yes. So there's no real expectation right. because the lines are far apart. The lines are right next to each other, right? There's no main effect of alcohol they have to get alcohol. No, there is an effect. There is a main effect of alcohol because of the slope. The lines are not flat. Right. There's no interaction because? That's right, the lines are parallel. They are not moving towards each other in any way. Right? If they were moving towards each other, or if they actually touched across, they would be thinking interaction. Here's what the same data, very same data, looks like in a bar graph. Like I said, I think main effects are really easy to see in bar graphs. <laughs> All right, so we're thinking about expectation. We said expectation, black bars versus white bars. So if I took the average of the black bars and compared it to the average of the white bars, you think they'd be very different? Take the black bars together and the white bars together. No. Be really close together. It's like those. It's like the lines being right next to each other. Yeah. So we're comparing for the expectation. Black to white. Okay. Black to white. For beverage, we're comparing not alcoholic to alcoholic. But for this one, wouldn't there be like a big difference between the average of the black and the white? No, if I took the average of the white, if I stack this black up here and then cut it in half, it'd be about there. If I stack this white up there and then cut it in half, it'd be about there. So no. What you're seeing is, what's, you're making your brain go, Fiery, fiery, is you're seeing the huge effect of beverage, which was that big slope in the line graph. But now what we're comparing is the average of the not alcoholic group to the average for the alcoholic group. The average for the alcoholic group is huge. People who got an alcoholic beverage shocked at about 110 volts, where people who got a non alcoholic beverage were down there around 20. Does that make sense? So you're, you're right. There's a main effect in there. It's just the one down here, okay. not the one. Now, interaction, remember last time we said, we look at the line graph, the lines were parallel, not moving towards each other, not touching, not intersecting. So no interaction. On this graph, we see that when we say, all right, let's look, we're looking for direction and difference, right? So I start over here and I say, okay, the black bars are a tiny bit taller than the white bars. And then I look at the next comparison and see if I get the same pattern. Yep, black bars are a tiny bit taller than the white bars, so same direction. Black one's taller, same difference, a tiny bit. So because it's the same direction and same difference, no interaction. Does that make sense? You okay? If people are very visual, this is people like this if they're very visual people. We're going to go the same pattern over and over. All right. Here's another one. Do I have a possible main effect of expectation? People say yes. Why? <laughs> it's like, I know it's one of those. It's the slope or the separation, but I can't remember which one. So if it's in the legend, we're interested in the separation of the lines. The further apart the lines are, the more likely we have a main effect of that variable. And that's because one of these lines represents one of those conditions, and the other line represents the other condition. So if the lines are far apart, it means that the behavior in those two conditions was very different. Okay, so the further apart the lines are, the more likely it is that we have a main effect. So we've got a possible main effect of expectation here because these bars are separate. They're not right up, I mean, these lines are separate. They're not right next to each other. There's some distance, so it's possible. We have a possible main effect of beverage. Does it matter whether people got an alcoholic beverage or a non-alcoholic beverage? Does it matter? Yeah. Matter a lot. And we can tell that because the slope is a very steep slope, right? Down here, people who didn't get an alcoholic beverage whew, shot up. You have people up here who got an alcoholic beverage. You have this huge 
shift. A big shift. The people who got alcoholic beverages shopped at a much higher rate. Is there an interaction? No. How do you know? They're parallel. Yep. Yeah, they are not moving towards each other. They do not touch. They do not intersect. They do not have a direction. Okay, so we've got two main effects, no interaction. There's a main effect of expectation, such that people who were expecting alcohol administered a higher intensity shock than people who weren't expecting alcohol. We've got a main effect of beverage, such that people who got an alcoholic beverage administered a higher intensity of shock than people who got a non-alcoholic beverage, but there's no interaction. Here's that same pattern, right, same one. So two main effects, no interaction, but with more right. So here is, we're going to talk about this one. Okay, What am I comparing if I want to know whether there's a difference for what's in the legend? What am I comparing? Black bars and, and the white bars. So I'm going to take the average of the black bars and compare it to the average of the white bars. So if you want to do that in your head, you can think about taking this bar and stacking it on top and cutting it in half. Take this bar, stack it on top, and cut it in half. You think the black bar is going to be, the black average is going to be higher than the white average? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's your main effect of expectation. Now, we already said we've got a main effect of beverage. We saw on the line graph, we saw that big slope. We said the people who got alcoholic beverage shocked more than the people who got a non-alcoholic beverage. And we can see that here because if I took the average of these bars in the non-alcoholic group and I compared it to the average of the bars here in the alcoholic group, the one on the alcoholic group, much bigger, right? So the fact that these bars, the bars in the alcoholic condition are much taller tells us that we've probably got a main effect of beverage type, that it mattered what kind of beverage you got. If you've got an alcoholic beverage, we're shocking and shocking. People who got a non-alcoholic beverage shock lower amount. Oh my gosh, here we go. What's different about this one? What do we have for the first time? Interaction, possible interaction. Why do you know that? They're what? They're not parallel anymore. They're moving towards each other. They don't actually cross over. They don't actually touch. But they are definitely not parallel. They are moving towards each other. And if we had, you know, under different circumstances, we might actually be able to come up with, you know, lines that did touch. But here they're moving towards each other. Since they are not parallel, we can say, yeah, I think we have an interaction here. And another way to think about it is, it matters what combination of treatments people got. If we look here, this score, this score, and this score are all pretty similar. But this group up here, the people who got an alcoholic beverage and who thought they were going to get alcohol, they behaved the most aggressively. Okay, so this particular combination of one level of expectation one level of beverage, when that combination came together, it resulted in high voltage shock. That's the interaction. So we have an interaction of expectation and beverage such that participants who got an alcoholic beverage and were expecting it to be alcoholic administered significantly more intense shock than any of the other groups. Now, since we have an interaction, or it looks like we might, that means that we have to be more cautious about the other effects. Because in the presence of an interaction, main effects can be exaggerated or diminished. Okay. Interactions, because you've got two variables influencing each other, two or more, influencing each other, it's possible that you're seeing something for a single factor that wouldn't show up if that was just there by itself. So we can use our cues, but we'll see that they're not as easy to 
work with, or we don't feel quite as confident about our findings because they're a little bit funky in this case. So, for example, we talked about how the distance between the lines tells us whether or not we have a main effect of expectation. Well, what does that mean in this case? Down here at this end, the lines are close together. Up here at this end, they're far apart. So, are they close together or far apart? Yes. <laughs> right? So, we're just not as confident. So maybe there could be, but we just aren't going to be like, yeah, I think we've got a main effect. Because we don't know. Is this showing up just because of the interaction? Maybe. I mean, it looks like we could have a main effect, but we're just not feeling as confident. If I look down here at the x-axis, remember my thing is about slope. Well, the lines definitely aren't flat, but this one's certainly flatter than that one. So do I have a main effect? Probably, but I'm not really sure how strong of an effect it is because one's not very strong, one's much stronger, so what's the truth and is it the average? I don't know. So I feel much less confident about how robust this main effect might be. I think this is actually, to see main effects is a little bit easier in bar graph form, as I said. If we take a look here, we use our cues in the bar graph, the main effects actually seem a little bit clearer. So, I'm doing a main effect of this variable up here in the legend. I'm comparing black bars to white bars. So if I ask you if I do the average of the black bars compared to the average of the white bars, do you think it's going to be different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. And if I look at beverage, and I'm comparing the average of the non-alcoholic bars to the average of the alcoholic bars, do you think it's going to be different? Yeah, this one's going to be bigger. So that's great and everything, but we also have to think about whether or not there's an interaction. And the interaction in the bar graph shows up here. Remember, we're thinking about difference and direction. Okay. So I start off over here with my first comparison. Black is a little bit taller than white. Okay. Black's a little bit taller than white. But as I come over here, is it true? Do I get the same pattern? Well, I've got the same direction. Black is still taller than white, but it's not a little bit taller. It's a lot taller. So because I don't have the same difference, I have a much bigger difference here, that tells me I've got an interaction. If the difference or the direction is not the same, the pattern's not the same, then you've got an interaction. Yeah. Um, for the x axis. Hold on. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. On the exam, are we going to get like both the bar graph and the line graph? Or if we got the line graph that's similar to the one that we just looked at, do we have to explain why we're not confident and why? Yes. So you need to be able to, I could put any of these graphs on the test and ask you, I'll say, so does this graph show a possible main effect? How confident are you? Why? Uh, or does this show an interaction? I could also say, here are some graphs. Show me the one that has a main effect of IV1 in the legend and interaction, but doesn't have a main effect of the IV on the x-axis. So you need to be able to identify the possibility of the different effects from the graph. You should be able to match the effects to a graph or read the graph and tell me what you see. Okay. Interaction? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This is a crossover interaction. This is the most robust. This is, yeah, we definitely have an interaction. We really, really do. And again, you know, we're, we're very confident we've got an interaction. A nice, clear crossover here. Um, but when we start to use the characteristics that tell us whether or not we have main effects, it's kind of like, well, I don't know. It doesn't, I don't think so. For example, if I'm comparing these two things, comparing expectation and no expectation. The levels of what's up here in the legend. I'm thinking about how far apart are the bars from each other? How far apart are they from each other? Well, over here, they're really far apart. And over here, they're really close together. In fact, they actually cross over. So they're not far apart at all. They're actually over the top. Where this one's high up here and low down here, and this one's high up here, and this one's low down here. So they're not really far apart at all. 
they lay they actually cross over. So no main effect probably. But I think about the slope. Down here in the well, the lines definitely aren't flat. The thing is, one of them has a positive slope and the other one has a negative slope, so they cancel out. No main effect of beverage. No main effect of what's on the x-axis. Now, I think it's a little bit easier to see this in the bar graph. If I'm doing what's up here in the legend, I'm comparing the average of the black bars to the average of the white bars. If I average these two black bars together, and I compare it to the average of these two white bars, is it going to be different? <laughs> no, it's going to be exactly the same. No main effect of expectation. If I average the non-alcoholic bars and the alcoholic bars, is there going to be a difference? Nope. No main effect of beverage. But the interaction, remember, difference and direction. So if I look at the difference, I have a difference of this much, big difference. And the direction is white taller than black. And I come over here. Oh, same difference. Great. But now it's black taller than white. So the direction is different. And since the direction is different, I have an interaction. OK, your question. Um, okay, for like the slope part or the x-axis um, for the bar graphs, we're looking at the average still? Okay. Yep. So we're talking about what's on the x-axis. See, I have the caddis, so this axis is beverage type, right? So I'm comparing the different levels of that IV. And the levels are non-alcoholic and alcoholic. So I compare the average of these bars to the average of these bars. And if I did that, it would be the same. I thought that's what you did for main effect. And then after that, you look at the x-axis. No, 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 that's fine. That's, that's what I'm talking about. I am talking about the main effect. OK. But the interaction part is that I look at the difference and the direction of this comparison. And it's a big difference with white taller than black. And then over here, I still get that same big difference. but. Now it's black taller than white, so the direction is different, and that tells me there's an interaction. Okay. That's the bar chart equivalent of the big crossover effect. Yeah. So there's no effect in the expecting alcohol or not because the amount of white and the amount of black are the same, though they're different. Yeah. It doesn't matter, just because you're mushing them together. So it would be if like, there was a bunch of black and this much white on the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Exactly right. Okay. Now let's say we switch it up a little bit. Getting crazy now. We're going to add another level of alcohol. So it's not just whether you're drunk or not, but we're going to go with legal definitions now. Imagine that we looked at blood alcohol content. We have people who are sober, people who are impaired, so their blood alcohol content is 0.05. And then we have people who are legally intoxicated. They are drunk. Okay. At 1.0. Okay. So Still expecting or not expecting alcohol. How does this change what we do? Well, if we're just talking main effects, not much. Do you see the main effect of expectation? Not really. I mean, a little bit. Possibly. Possibly. They're not super far apart, right? But we're talking about are the lines far apart from each other? It's still the same kind of comparison. It doesn't matter that we have three categories down here. Makes no difference. The lines are still not right up next to each other. So main effect of expectation, people who were expecting alcohol tended to shock higher intensity than people who were not expecting alcohol. So these are the excuse givers. Now if we look at blood alcohol content, how drunk were they? We have not flat lines. So we see that there's an effect. It's a linear effect. The more alcohol in their bloodstream, the higher the intensity of the shock. People with a zero blood alcohol content shocked less than people at 0.05, and people at 0.05 shocked less than people at 0.1. And people at zero shocked less than people at 
one won't. Nice linear effect. No interaction. Right? Because? Parallel lines. They're parallel. Yeah. Nice parallel lines. So it looks just the same. Yeah. Um, when you say the lines aren't super far apart, are, are all of our graphs going to have the same scale? Because the scale with, you know, smaller numbers and they would seem to be further apart. Right. So the scale, you will just say, so, you know, if I want you to see that they're, like, literally right next to each other, they're going to be, like, laying right next to each other like we're doing here in the exam. If, if you see, you know, if there's a clear width of 10, 20, 30 in between, like this, then you could go, yeah, there's a possible thing. I mean, we're not doing any math. You don't know for sure if there's a main effect or not. Right. So it depends on sample size. I just want you to say that there's a possible main effect. Okay. And if they're right next to each other, there's not a possible main effect. So don't really worry about the scale. Okay. okay. So here's what that looks like in the bar graph form. So we do the one in the legend, comparing black bars to white bars. We took the average of the black bars. <laughs> Compared to the average of the white bars, average of the black bars would be bigger. That's because people who were expecting alcohol shocked more, higher intensity, than people who were not expecting alcohol. Now take a look down here, blood alcohol content. If I take the average at 0, the average at 0.05, and the average at 0.1, pretty clearly that average is growing, 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 right? That nice linear effect. The more alcohol people had in their system, the higher the intensity of shock they administered. Interaction? No. My difference is about this much, about hand width, a little bit of wrist for me, maybe a racer length on your pencil for you. Okay. That length, and black is taller than white. Okay, let's look at the next comparison. Same distance, and black is taller than white. Okay, still no interaction. Same difference, and same direction. So, the black bar is always taller than the white bar right next to it, and it's taller by the same amount. So, no interaction. Oh, now things are starting to get messy. This is what they typically really look like. It's never super clean. But do we have an interaction here? Most likely. Probably, yeah. How do you know? The lines aren't parallel. The lines aren't parallel. Okay, they're moving towards each other. They don't ever actually touch or cross over, but they're not parallel. So there's a possibility of an interaction here. Do we have an effective expectation? Does it matter whether people were expecting alcohol or not? Maybe. I mean, we do see the lines aren't right next to each other. They're closer here and further apart up here, and kind of middle distance there. So they aren't right next to each other, but it does seem to kind of depend on which other, which blood alcohol content we're talking about, right? That's the interaction, right? So it looks like there's there could be a main effect, but we have to keep in mind because we have an interaction, that main effect could represent a distortion. But it seems like. And now what about blood alcohol content? Does it look like it mattered whether people had no alcohol in their bloodstream or mildly intoxicated or legally drunk? Yes. Yes. Why do you think so? The lines have a slope. The lines have a slope that's not zero, right? They're sloping up. This one's kind of close to flat, but this one's definitely not. So looks like, yeah, probably, but again, in the presence of the interaction, we want to be a little cautious. Um, what's interesting, what we see happening here is that it seems like it's kind of, yeah, they're kind of moving apart, and then it gets a little bit more extreme. And again, we see that these are all kind of the same, and these two are kind of the same, but this one up here is really the standout condition. So again, the interaction, that significant interaction we, we see, or that we think we see, is telling us that people who were expecting alcohol and who were legally drunk administered the highest 
mean intensity of shock of all the groups. You see that? These folks up here? These are the drunks who are thought they were going to get drunk. And they're just like, <laughs> really mean. What about this one? How is it different? This is what we call a dose specific interaction. What makes it different? Dose specific interaction. Who's on the interaction if they're under one condition but not under the other two? Yeah, so we've got an interaction, but the interaction's only really kicking in at this highest alcohol level. Only for the people who are legally drunk. These two, I mean, we see these lines are definitely not parallel, okay? but down here at the lower blood alcohol level, they are. So the interaction emerges at a specific dosage, which is the highest dosage. That's why we call it a dose-specific effect or a dose-specific interaction. We see the interaction, but only at a particular dose. There's no interaction at the lower dosage, and there's definitely an interaction at the higher dosage. Down here, the lines are pretty close. They're closer to flat. They're a little bit sloped, so we might have a main effect. But here, definitely we've got some more slope. So here the interaction is really exaggerating difference that we certainly don't see down here. And the lines are pretty close together down here at the lower dosages, but they get really far apart up here, potentially exaggerating the main effect of that. So we see that dose-specific effect, we're really interested in the interaction. It's very compelling to us, and it really seems to matter getting that combination. When you get that combination of expectation of alcohol and high blood alcohol content, people just get mean. Mean, mean people. Shocking. Poor, innocent Confederates. Well, not really, but they think they are. Okay. Here's what that would look like in a bar graph. So we think about the interaction. We see that dose-specific effect here. Here we have black a little bit taller than white. Here we have black a little bit taller than white. So same pattern, no interaction. And then all of a sudden, when we get to this third comparison, Black's not a little bit taller than white, it's a lot taller than white. So we've seen that interaction burst out there at the end. There is no specific interaction. We can see that because the difference only occur, it only shifts there in that one final blood alcohol content condition. Now if we think about the main effects, we'll be talking about Averaging the black bars and comparing it to the average of the white bars, that would look like we have a main effect. We talk about blood alcohol content main effect, it would be averaging the zero bars compared to averaging the 0.05 bars compared to averaging the 0.1 bars. It would look like we have an effect. But because of that interaction, again, we're like, well, maybe, but it could just be that the interaction is making those things kind of pop for us. So it could be. But I'm really interested in the interaction, because that's what's compelling about this. People who think they're going to get drunk and who get drunk are mean. Meaner than people who experience other combinations of factors. All right. So now, we're going to move on to something else. But I want to ask first, is everybody OK with those parameters? You understand what you need to do, what you need to compare to figure out main effects and interactions for line graphs and bar graphs. Feel like you got that? You're going to do it on the problem set. You're going to do it on the test. Now I want to talk about math. So we're going to figure out some formula stuff. I'm going to present a new experiment just because I'm tired of talking about expectation and <laughs> alcohol. Um, just some, I, this is a, a real phenomenon. Uh, that I wanted to show you a graph for and some data for. Um, and what we're manipulating here, again, we've got now a 3 by 2 random groups factorial. So six different conditions. And what we're manipulating is people's level of arousal. This isn't sexual arousal. This is more like how 
uh, hyped up they are. So they could be like totally flying on caffeine. Right? So these people ha don't have any caffeine in their bloodstream. These people have a moderate amount. These people have just, they've just done like three, four hour energies. I know, slam, slam, they're like, I need 12 hours of energy, let's go. And, but have you, have you ever had too much caffeine? Mm. What happens when you've had too much caffeine? Yeah, yes, like last week. <laughs> what? Well, we're taking your class. Of course we've had too much caffeine. It happens all the day. God, God, does I know? All right, so what happens when you've had too much caffeine? <laughs> your heart's yeah. racing. You're like, caffeine's supposed to help me focus, right? If you have a little bit of caffeine, or say your level, uh, or else is low. You haven't really had any caffeine. You're kind of like, eh, I'm kind of not You have a little bit of caffeine. You're more alert. You can kind of focus, and it's good. Then you think, hey, if a little bit's good, a lot's even better. And then you can't do anything, right? Then you're like, okay, that was a really bad idea. <laughs> Too much of a good thing, right? So that's kind of what happens with arousal. We, I mean, that is arousal. When we get too amped, it actually makes it hard for us to do what we need to do. We need to be moderately amped to do what we need to do, and not too low. Not, we don't want our arousal to be so low that we kind of just don't care where. Fall asleep. Right? We need to be kind of moderately amped, not super amped or under amped. Okay? And it actually interacts with how hard the task is that we're doing. In other words, how our arousal affects us depends on whether we're doing something that is really easy for us or something that's really hard for us. So here's what happens. Okay. Look, we've got a dose specific effect here. See it? Now, what we've got going on here is this line up here, this is people's performance, how well they do when they've got an easy task. So if you're doing something that's really easy for you, like putting on your clothes, you're pretty good at putting on clothes. Right? You've been doing it for a long time. Hopefully, you're your self dresser. And so if you're kind of sleepy, you might be really slow about it. But the more awake you are, the faster you can do it. And if you're in a hurry, like you know, I gotta get out of here, I've got five minutes to get to class, you're like, zip, 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 done. And you're all dressed and everything, and it all works, and you're very quiet. Something easy. But if you're doing something that's really cognitively challenging to you, or physically challenging, then at a low level, your performance is not very good, because it's really hard for you and you're not very amped up, you're not very tuned in, so you're not going to be very good at it. At a moderate level of amplitude, you actually improve, you get better. So being more alert, more tuned in, more focused actually helps you do something that's hard for you. Makes sense. You're doing something that's a little bit hard, you have to focus, so it helps you. But if you get too amped up, things that are hard for you, you're so amped up you can't focus on all the details of all the complex stuff you have to do and you end up crashing. So there's an interaction in that easy problems actually you get better at doing them the more amped you are, but hard problems you get worse. Now this is why you want to practice stuff because you want it to be easy for you not hard because it means the more amped you get, the better you get, as opposed to if you're not very good at something, the more amped you get, you crash. <laughs> this is why I tell you, do your practice problems. Because you want them to be easy when you come to the test and you're amped up because you did, just did two Red Bulls before you got to the exam. Not hard. <laughs> and then you're like, I don't even have a note card. You don't want to go there. I can't read my note card. I don't even know what these symbols mean anymore. So let's take a look. This now should look a little bit familiar. This is an APA source table, APA style source table for the data you just saw. And so you know what the graph looks like. It looks like we've got an interaction. We may have main effects of task difficulty and level of arousal too. So you saw that graph. Now we've got things like sum of squares, degrees of freedom, mean square. You've seen these all before. Just to make sure everyone's oriented to this chart, can you tell me what the sum of squares for level of arousal is? 60. 60. Can you tell me what the degrees of freedom for task difficulty is? One. One. What is the mean square for the interaction of arousal times difficulty? 
So what's my sum of squares total? 360. 360, okay. Uh, what's my degrees of freedom within conditions? 24. 24, okay. So everybody knows how to get their way around that chart. I see people, they're like, like oh gosh, it's gonna get scary now. No, it's actually good. You're gonna, I'm, you're gonna impress yourself now. I'm gonna show you how really incredibly smart you are right now. All right, now you guys remember, you remember independent Vincenova, right? It was just last week. <laughs> it's not gone yet, right? All right, now, when we calculate F observed for independent groups ANOVA, what formula do we use? F observed for independent groups. Oh, you can totally do this. <laughs> you can do this. Mean squared between conditions over mean squared uh, within conditions, conditions, right? Independent groups, right? That's the easy one. You didn't do it. We don't do error. That's that's related. That's related groups. We're going to go in there. Remember, this is all. These are all independent. I told you this is random groups factorial. So everything's between, all between, all the time. So when we do it, it's mean square between conditions over mean square within conditions, right? You believe me? I'm not just making something up that looks vaguely familiar. Yes? No, don't, don't get stunned yet. We still have a few more minutes of class. You can't shut down yet. Okay. Shut down later when you leave. Not yet. All right. Now, you will notice, oh, look, there is no mean square between conditions on this chart. If there's no mean square there, then you're probably not going to use that one. But there are several other mean squares on here, right? There's a mean square for level of arousal. There's a mean square for task difficulty. There's a mean square for arousal times difficulty. And there's a mean square within conditions. Guess what we're going to use? Oh, we've got just, oh, it's happening. Arousal times task difficulty. It's working. We have moderate level of arousal, moderate task difficulty. We can do this. OK, so let's say I want to do F observed. For level of arousal. So I'm trying to figure out if there's a main effect of level of arousal. Okay, and I'm going to do the math now. Okay, main effect, this is for IV1. Okay. Do I have a mean square within conditions I could plug into that slot? Yes, I do. Oh, yes, it's right there. It's 5. Okay, I've got a mean square within conditions. I could use that. I don't have a mean square between conditions, but I do have a mean square for level of arousal, right? So I actually have a mean square for IV1. It's right there, 30. So if I take 30 and divide it by 5, what do I get? Okay to graduate from college seniors. I take 30 and I divide it by 5 and I get 6. six. All right, excellent. You guys are so terrified that you might actually get this. You just calculated F observed for the main effect. It's 6. You need a calculator or anything. All right. Now, you've got F observed, but you need F critical to compare it to. If you're going to do F critical, you know you need a degrees of freedom numerator and a degrees of freedom denominator to look it up, right? So my numerator over there was mean square for IV1, right? Mean square for level of arousal. So I need the degrees of freedom that goes with that. Well, if this was the mean square I used, what's the corresponding degrees of freedom? Right there. It's right next to it. So I'm going to use 2, and my denominator was this mean square within conditions, so I'm going to use the degrees of freedom that goes with that, 24. And there's the degrees of freedom you need to look up the critical value in the table. So if I tell you alpha is 0.05, you look it up like you would any other critical value. 2 and 24. 
All right? Now let's apply. I need you to calculate F observed for task difficulty. We're going to calculate F observed for task difficulty. What are you going to put? This is the F observed for IV2. What number are you going to put in the numerator for your F ratio? F observed for IV2. I have a vote for 120. How many people think she's right? Yeah. Yes, she is right. Okay. And what about, what are you going to put in the denominator? Five again. Five again. Yep. So 120 divided by 5. 24. Yeah. So your F observed is 24. Done. Now if you're going to look up the critical value, what degrees of freedom do you need? What's your degrees of freedom numerator? 1. And what's your degrees of freedom denominator? 24. You got it. So that's what you would need to figure out if there's a main effect of task difficulty. That's your F observed and your F critical for task difficulty. That's how you're going to figure out if you have a main effect for that. Okay. Now, for the interaction, you were going to calculate F observed for the interaction. What value are you going to put in the numerator of your F ratio? For the interaction, arousal times difficulty. What number are you going to put in the numerator for your F ratio? 30. 30, right? The mean square for the interaction. What number is going to go in your denominator? 5. 5, the mean square within conditions. What degrees of freedom are you going to use to look up F critical? 2 and? 24. Aren't you guys smart? Check it out. You guys are actually figuring out formulas on your own now. I don't even have to give you formulas. You can figure them out based on what you already know. Because you're smart. But in case you need help, in case you want to remember, you'll notice in your packet that, in fact, there's some hints about what you need to do. How to get main effects and how to get interactions. So the formulas are listed there in your packet. And know how to do that. Now, before you get all crazy and run out of here, because we still have one more thing. We're going to pick it up one more time. Let's see if we're still at that moderate level of arousal or if your brains have melted. We don't have any information yet about at a square. It's not there in your packet. But let's see if we can figure it out. Four. Independent group SONOVA to calculate eta squared for okay, just for one factor. The formula was sum of squares between conditions over sum of squares between conditions plus sum of squares within conditions. Right? Yes, we vaguely yeah. remember that. It looks somewhat familiar. We'll trust you on this. Okay? So, given that information and given what we've already done, if you had to guess, make an informed guess, not just a pulling this out of your ear guess, but like an informed guess, because you were informed. What do you think the formula is for calculating eta squared for level of arousal? What would you use? Sum of squares for for IV1 over sum of squares for IV1 plus sum of squares within conditions. Yes. You go. That's how you would calculate eta squared for the main effect. Does it make sense? Since we're talking about level of arousal, we're going to use the sum of squares for level of arousal. And because when we calculate that main effect, we use these numbers and these numbers for our denominator, we'll use within conditions, just like we would otherwise. Okay? All right? Brave souls? 
If I was going to do this for the main effect of task difficulty, what would I do? So I would do, if I was doing eta squared for the main effect of task difficulty, it would be 120 over 120 plus 120. Make sense? Okay, what if I wanted to do eta squared for the interaction? I would use sum of squares for the interaction over sum of squares for the interaction plus sum of squares within conditions. So it would be 60 over 60 plus 120. Make sense? All right, you should now know everything you need to know to kick problem set number four in the tail. Go. You can do it. If you have questions, let me know.